Welcome to Buckets, brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. My name is Matt Moore, and this is your NBA Draft Betting Guide, Part 1. We're going to do two, two NBA Draft Betting Guides, because this draft might be a big pile of garbage, but that only means there's more uncertainty, which means we got more chances to get some good bets in. Here's the plan. Today, I'm going to talk to Brandon Anderson, NBA futures analyst and uh, draft Nick obsessive. And we're going to get his take on these various prospects and give you some more information on how to think logically about them. I'll fill in with a lot of my stuff based off of what I've heard, because I don't spend time breaking down film. I break down time trying to figure out what teams think of who, what's real and what's not in a world of bullshit that is the NBA draft intel. We're going to break all that down. I, I Best bets will be tough, but I will be giving out uh, a couple of leans here. The best bets episode tomorrow. We're going to do that on, it'll actually be out on Wednesday for you with Mike Fiddle and Joe Delera. We will have best bets for you coming off of what should be the last 24 hours inside of the NBA draft. As a reminder, everything we talk about can be found on the award-winning Action Network app. You can also check out all sorts of great content on youtube.com slash the Action Network where... On Wednesday night, during the draft, we're going to go about 30 minutes before the start of the NBA draft through the first five picks. We're doing buckets live. There is too much to break down. We, I, I genuinely think we're going to see some wild market swings in that last 30 minutes. We've seen that the last couple of years with a lot of craziness. So we're going to do that. Mike Fiddle's going to be on to break down the market. Brandon's going to be with me to make fun of the market and also to, to be able to give his analysis on who's going where and why this pick was a disaster for whoever team picks whoever. We'll do all of that through the first five picks. Then after, we're doing another Buckets Live. You got double Buckets Live reacting to the NBA draft. Brandon and I will look at the trades that go on. We'll look at futures options. We'll look at rookie of the year market in what's going to be a pretty wide open field. The long shots are going to be valuable. You know Brandon's going to be already having some takes on who he wants to bet for rookie of the year come Wednesday. So make sure to check that out. Two Buckets Lives on Wednesday at youtube.com slash the Action Network. All right, Brandon, let's do this thing. We're going to break down the top five, the consensus top five. We'll get your thoughts on it about what these guys look like, how they project, and then I'm going to give you the intel based off of what I've heard in my expectation for where they go in the NBA draft. We're going to start with who was the number one pick at the time of the lottery. That is Alexander Starr. We're going to get in, get in on him immediately and talk about him. The current favorite in the market is Zachary Rieseche, but we're going to start with Saar. What do you think about Saar and his prospects in the NBA? I like him. I, I, I think I won't be saying often on this podcast, I fear, but I like Saar. I am usually a bit late to the international guys. So he's a guy that I hadn't watched a lot of during like college season. And then I finally, there, there were a couple of games his team played against the G League Ignite team that we'll get to some of those guys too, that they played those like back in the fall. And I watched those. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, this is a clear top five draft pick. Like in any draft, this is a guy that's going to go near the top of the draft. Uh, I think of him as kind of a supercharged Jaron Jackson Jr. or Jabari Smith type. And to me, that is a winning player type. That is a defensive player that is about athleticism and it's about like blocking shots at the rim rim protection i think he can scramble on defense and he's a versatile defender to me we'll get to clean in a second but this is a 16 gamer this is a scheme versatile defender like jabari hopefully like jaron jackson a guy that gives you options defensively a guy that you can play with in the playoffs multiple rounds mini matchups a thing i don't think about cling in um offensively We'll see. I think that, that the offense is a project, and we'll see where it goes. He's comfortable shooting. With with the prospects, you want to focus almost as much on how often do you shoot and how comfortable are you shooting and dribbling and passing as the actual results. Like, if the coach is willing to let you try some crap, then that's good that you're willing to do that. Versus the guys who are like, yeah, I shot 38% on threes, but I only took 30 the entire season. Like, that's nothing. I would rather see you miss more and take a bunch of them, which is kind of what Sar did. He missed a bunch, but he shot a lot. He's got some flashes passing. I think he can be on the short roll a little bit. Like body size, he's kind of like a Chris Bosh, Evan Mobley-ish sort of thing. That would have scared me more 10 years ago. That would have felt like a tweener sort of thing. But I think that's where the modern NBA is going. And especially now, we got more teams doing double bigs. So I don't love him. I don't love anyone in this draft, but I like him. He's a solid 
top three to five pick for me makes sense for any team. Okay. Two questions for you. One, how does he fit next to Onyeko Kongwo? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I feel like I feel like we're a little short-ish overall. I guess Sar is 7-1, so that's a weird thing to say when you're playing two big men then. Um, I think it works. I, I think it works all right. I, I like Okongwu a lot. I, I like both of them are very versatile defenders. I, I thought of Okongwu as a, a Bam out of bio type coming out. And like, we haven't really seen him get a big chance, but that's high praise. Like we both like him a lot. You are very high in Bam out of bio. So having two versatile defenders that are a little different, I think Okongwu is a stronger rim protector. I think Sar is more of a, a roamer. Like when we've seen Jaron Jackson, we've seen like the Celtics with Robert Williams last year where they play him at the four then and let him kind of just do stuff, move around, play, make, scramble. I like that combination, especially, you know, if you happen to have some truly terrible guard defenders, that might be a good, and we'll see, maybe they won't have them anymore, but I, I think that can work all right to me. Yeah, so the question there is like, does DeJounte Murray or Trey Young fit better with him? And I don't really know if there's if there is an answer to that. The Hawks are trying to move Clint Capella. They're gonna they've been trying to move him for two years. I don't know if they're actually gonna be able to pull the trigger and find a deal or not, but they want to move Capella pretty badly. It's been pretty urgent. Uh, I don't know if Sar necessarily fits that. Now, here's the other thing. He hasn't worked out for Atlanta. He turned down Atlanta twice for those. Oh. But he's made it very clear he does not want to be selected by the Atlanta Hawks, whatever the reason is for that. That doesn't mean the Hawks can't take him. This happens all the time where guys don't work out for a team and the squad takes him anyway. If you believe he's the best player and you have the number one pick, you should take him anyway. I do think there is probably a little bit level of like, really, kid? Really? You, you think you're too good to go number one? Really? Because you're like the eighth pick in a lot of drafts. Maybe not all of them. Maybe you're like fifth in a lot of the average drafts. But like, you're not necessarily the number one. I think Atlanta is a little annoyed by that. I just don't think that they're very in on him in general. Uh, there are other guys that I think would go there, but I do think that, like, I don't – it is kind of tricky where it, it's very interesting to ask the question of if he doesn't go one and if he doesn't go two, where does he go? Because mm -hmm. he and the next guy we're going to talk about, which is Zachary Risache, I think are in the same boat, which is if they don't go top two, which is the expectation, it has been the expectation for some time, I don't know where they go because things get very weird as we go down the list. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So let's go to Zachary Risache. Give me your profile on him and the notoriously terrible, terrible athletic measurements for Zachary Risache. Oh my gosh. The, he, the athletic measurements are a disaster. I, I am not in on Risache. I am, I have him outside of my lottery. This is just not Ooh. a player that I feel the need to take a swing on. Now, I don't know a lot about him. So I might, part of it is just like, I, I haven't seen enough to feel like I need to be in on him. He has good size. He's six foot nine, but the size profile is a little bit limited in that his wingspan is also six nine. You, like you want a six nine guy. If you're, you're focusing on size, you want him to be like a seven foot wingspan. You want to have a nine foot standing reach because you want the defense that comes with that. He doesn't have that. He's thin. I'm not sure the body's going to really fill out in a huge way. And then the athletic profile. There's a there's a, a word called B spark that just kind of stands for like all the combine stuff combined. His it, it goes it depends on what your height and weight is and then how athletic are you for that. He is in the fourth percentile in B spark in among all NBA draft prospects from the last like 15 years or so. That's really bad. He had a 31 inch vertical. He was very bad at lane agility. That's like quick, shifty, change of directions. He was very bad at sprint. Like, all the things measured very poorly for him. And frankly, again, I haven't seen a ton of him. That's what I saw when I watch. I'm like, oh, this dude is playing French League, guys, and still looks unathletic. That seems real problematic to me because, sorry, but the NBA is going to be more athletic than the French League guys that he's playing against. I I'm skeptical because... The athletic profile, the body profile doesn't scream number one pick to me at all. The thing people love about him is the shooting. And he took a big shooting leap this year to 39%. That seems great. But before the season, people didn't like his shot. He was like not anywhere in the mix for this near the top of the draft. And from January 31st forward, he shot 23% on threes. So 
I am sensing like, oh, cool. We had like two awesome months of shooting and decided, well, the draft sucks. We need somebody to be good. How about a guy with size that can shoot and play on the wing? Like, that all sounds great. Everybody wants a guy that can shoot and play on the wing and defend a little bit with some size. I just think that's theoretical here to me. Uh, I don't see great rebounding here for his size. He's been very poor at the rim. He doesn't get to the rim. He doesn't really have a mid-range. It To me, I see project. And if the shot isn't real, which I fear, then I think that the upside is really limited too. So I, I, I'm glad that the teams that I am invested most in do not have a high draft pick because I would not want this man as a high draft pick on my teams. Cue the Chicago yeah. Bulls trading up multiple picks and getting this guy to build our team around. Yeah, watch, watch for that. So here's what's surprising is Risa Shea is a guy that's taken the most steam. He is mocked consensus number one across the board to the Atlanta Hawks. Or at least that pick placement. I will say that I am skeptical a little bit of that. I am skeptical of him of him being this lock for number one, which means I do think there's value on some other guys that we'll talk about, or one other guy that we'll talk about. Um, my understanding is that the Wizards would be perfectly happy if Sar went one and they got Risa Shea. I think they would be. Hmm. I think they would be very happy with that. Everything you described, like oh man, a very like unathletic, huge concerns, probably not going to be a franchise player. Screams Washington Wizard to me. <laughs> but even beyond like the joke, not fair with the new regime. Let's give the new regime some yeah, credit. Sure. It very screams true. old Wizards. It's true. It's true. But <laughs> truthfully, how many times have we done this with the Wizards? Um, I, but I'll say this: I wouldn't. I wouldn't be shot. Like, I don't think it's a matter of, let's say that Sar doesn't go number one. Uh, there is an expectation that the Wizards would take Sar. I think that Risha Shea and Sar are very close there. But here's like the thing is if Risha Shea doesn't go one, he could slip. And then it gets very interesting. And it depends on where he lands. Like, he's the consensus. I mean, again, bet MGM, he's minus 250. And I'm not saying he's not going to go number one. I'm not saying that because these things are fluid. Like any Intel that I report on here is going to be like extremely nebulous. What I will tell you is my read is that a lot of the noise about him going number one is coming from Risa Shea's camp, which we've seen in the past that team talks to the number one pick and is like, Oh yeah, it's definitely going to be us. And th that camp makes it known to everybody. And then that gets filtered through and everybody's like, well, I heard that they're taking Risa Shea because it, and it winds up coming from the, the guy that would benefit most from that happening. And that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen because that, that can absolutely be the case. It's simply a matter of, of I am skeptical that this is a minus 250. I do not believe that Risa Shea is a minus 250 to go number one. Um, what I will say that I do believe, based off of the conversations I've had, is the San Antonio Spurs would love to add Zachary Risa Shea. That they are a believer in Risa Shea, and that they would be looking to add him. Whether that's trading up for number one. Now, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, Mark Stein, one of the best reporters that you're ever going to see in cover the NBA ever, reported that the Spurs have interest in trading up for SAR. I haven't heard that. Everything I've heard with the Spurs is Risa Shea, Risa Shea, Risa Shea. He just may not be there. So the question is, do they trade up to either three if he falls to three, or do they try and move up to one to make sure that they get Risa Shea? It would not be trading the fourth pick it would be trading something else to get Risa Shea and keep the fourth. Interesting. But that's a scenario in which Risa Shea goes number one, is if you told me that if today a trade was approved where San Antonio acquired the number one pick, this minus 250, I think, then is too long, and it needs to be shorter. It needs to be like minus 400. Hmm. So that, to me, is where I'm at on uh, Risa Shea. That said, if he doesn't, if he were to get past, if he gets past San Antonio, I don't know where he goes. I don't know how far down the list he plummets. I really don't. Well, and, and it's, it gets weird there. it's not because like, I think if I'm interpreting right, what you're saying, we don't know where he goes. If he gets past them, not because like, well, they're the only team that's like that likes him. So he could just drop out. Like it's, we just, we assume he's been going top four. And so there's no buzz after that because, all the teams yep. aren't connected to him that we're only getting the Intel on the teams that are at the top. Right. 
but we'll talk a little bit more about this. Like this is all connected, yeah. right? But it, does Detroit take another big man in that spot? Right? Yeah. Does okay, if not Detroit, they probably look to trade out to somebody that does want Reese shape. Maybe he goes five. But if he gets the six and Charlotte doesn't trade out, I, I will tell you I don't believe the Charlotte Hornets take him. So that now we're at seven. Does Portland take him? Like Again, there, there's like a whole sequence here where it's like, oh man, okay, and like best player, I get it in terms of like best player talent on the board, but based off of what Brandon just told you, there's enough questions where if these if these analysts, if the teams that do like him don't get him because they took somebody else, and he slides, what if these later analysts have more of the opinion that Brandon does? True. And that's where it gets, I think, um, really interesting because Brandon's not the only one to feel this way about Reese Shea. With the and the like, the measurables are like those are objective numbers, and they're all bad. All right, let's talk about Brandon's favorite pick in this draft. That <laughs> I I was really surprised at this. So I was initially really down on him, and I don't really have opinions on any of these kids. I just listen to like what's been said about them. Tell me about Donovan Klingon. So with Reese Shea, I'm skeptical but I know that I might just be wrong. I might just not have enough information there. I just don't like Klingon. I think that he would be a massive mistake at the top of the draft. And I do mean massive because he is seven foot three with a near 10 foot standing reach. But like, like he's go bear size. He is a rim protector. He's an elite rim protector because of that size. That's the thing he's going to do well, but he is a very, very poor athlete for his size. He had very poor sprint numbers, shuttle numbers. He was basically last in the class. He he can't jump basically at all. He has a serious, well, maybe serious is too much. He has already, as a giant man, a history of foot injuries. That is like giant red flags to me. How many times in NBA history have we seen a huge human being have foot injuries? He had a foot injury, he had an ankle injury. He missed time a bunch. He also at UConn on a title team where he was a key important defender for them only at, only played like 22 minutes a game because they had to be careful with his injuries and because he has very poor conditioning because of his athleticism. So he like, he's not getting the foul trouble. That's what you would think with a guy of this size. Like, oh, okay, well, he's trying to defend. He's fouling a lot. No, no, no. He actually doesn't do that. That's great. That's good for him. He just can't play for more than like three or four minutes at a time in college. That is very problematic to me. The rim protection thing is great. Like, obviously, that is very valuable. We, we know this. But I think even there, you're, you're confined to playing drop. Like, that's exactly what he's going to be. We know what that means in the playoffs, where that may not go deep into the playoffs. Even that version of defense, I wonder against bigger, more athletic, faster dudes, how does that hold up now? Because I don't even know that he's super mobile around protecting the rim. It's been mostly a size thing. So I think even that could actually be a little less than expected. Rebounding-wise, kind of average for his size. You'd think that he should just be like a monster rebounder. And then offensively, there's not going to be a lot there. Like, he does not project to shoot at all. He's going to be a rim runner, but he can't jump, remember. He, he is a nice passer. I like that. So a little bit of passing on the post. But, like, to me, we're talking like, okay, Brooke Lopez, but if he didn't shoot... And also Brooke Lopez, but like five or 10 years from now, when Brooke Lopez's type is going to be a little less valuable as the NBA keeps moving that direction, I think, toward the 16 game sort of guys. Uh, put differently, you know how I felt a couple years ago about our guy Walker Kessler in the draft. Now I was wrong. Walker Kessler has been very good. Walker Kessler is freely available in trades right now, according to rumors, which is baffling to me. I did not expect that freely. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not free. I'm not sure I'd rather have Donovan Klingon than Walker Kessler. I think they're very similar sort of guys to me. And that's a valuable player in the regular season defensively. That's not a number one pick to me. Okay. Okay. So there's the hater raid <laughs> from, from Brandon Anderson. And oh, look, and all these kind of things, I'm not going to tell you that Brandon's right or wrong. Brandon does extensive work on this stuff and he can be absolutely right on this. And then, uh, if he's right, we'll go back and we'll absolutely post these clips. And if he's wrong, you'll never hear from them ever again. <laughs> um, but I, look, I think there are analysts I think that agree with with Brandon on Klingon. However, what I will say is, okay, you've heard all the bad stuff. Here's what I would say: if you told me right now, hey, I got a free roll, hundred bucks, 
I want to put it on somebody on, on to go number one in the NBA draft. First off, I'd be like, why? But second, um, I would be like, you should put it on Donovan Klingon, who is currently at Bed MGM, the king of sports books, plus 210. That's 33% implied, which I think is probably right. If you're asking me like where the number is off, it's that Risa Shea is too high. He's he's he is way, way to me, he is way too short. And uh out Alex Saar is probably too long. Uh, now, I bet Saar plus 550 just because I was like, look, he was a consensus number one at the time of the lottery. And a lot of times what happens is we go through this entire process and we wind up right back where we started. But with Klingon, I will tell you that I think he is, if I, if I had to guess, if you just said like, hey, guess the number one pick, Klingon would be my answer. Hmm. I think Quinn Snyder and the coaching staff in particular are very high on Donovan Klingon. I think he's a more established prospect. You mentioned all the drop stuff. Guess what defensive scheme Clint Snyder likes to run? Drop scheme. That's what he did with, with Rudy Gobert. I'm not comparing Donovan Klingon to Rudy Gobert. I am saying that like he's comfortable in using Klingon's skills in this kind of in this kind of defense. So I don't think that that's a problem for them. I think he fits better with the roster. You shouldn't consider fit when you have the number one pick, but the Hawks are in a little bit of a better, a, a weirder situation than normal. This is a weirder draft. This is not like, oh, there's absolutely this guy that you should take, no question. It's kind of like, no. they're all flawed. Which of the flaws do you prefer? Um, if he doesn't go one, there is a chance that he slides. If he slides, Memphis is going to try and get up to get him. I think that they would uh, call Detroit to try and get the fifth pick and take him. I think they would call Houston with the third pick to try and get him. And I think they would call Charlotte with the sixth pick to try and get him. I think that Memphis, if you ask me like to uh, handicap the teams for Donovan Klingon, I would say Hawks number one. And I would say Grizzlies number two. It's not that like the Wizards could take him at number two, right? I don't think the Rockets take him at three. I don't think he goes there. I, based off of what I've heard, I'd be surprised if San Antonio took him fourth. San Antonio is notoriously close to the vest, so maybe they take him. But I would say that like the most likely is one and then five is like where I would probably expect him to go the most. Um, and I don't think that. I think that he's probably the best value bet here, even though I think that 33% implied is about right, because I think that all three of Saar, Risa Shea, and Klingon should be about even, considering mm -hmm. how unstable the, the the trade market is. Does all that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. And, and just to clarify, too, I know you're not suggesting this, but just the listeners here, I, I clearly have very strong opinions on these guys. I am absolutely not betting my opinions on these guys. That is not the way I'm using this information and not the way you, a listener, should use this information. I don't think my opinion is useless entirely as far as betting markets go. That's why I'm on this podcast. But certainly, it's, I, I would not be like, well, I think Donovan Klingon stinks and is not a top pick. I have him outside of my lottery, so I will fade him in this way. Like, no, doesn't matter. We are betting on Intel. It is an entirely different thing. Uh, so, and, and I will say, too, to what you've said so far, if I do make draft bets, when I do, I am not going to bet pretty much ever on the minus 250 versions. I will always bet on uncertainty. And in this particular draft, with so much uncertainty, I think we are ripe for betting long shots, ripe for late swings like you're talking about uh, when we do our live buckets. Um, real quick, because we, we've talked about the Grizzlies. If you haven't listened yet, just came out Monday on buckets, our, our big uh, processing the season uh, episode. We talked about where we went wrong on Grizzlies last year and then learned so much we went right back in on the Grizzlies. What do you think about the Grizzlies if they get Donovan Klingon? How would that how would you feel about our early possible position with them? Uh, I have a Memphis Grizzlies poster in my office and I have a Memphis Grizzlies uh, mascot as my avatar on Twitter. I would boo. I would boo loudly. Uh, that's <laughs> now look, the kid could be awesome. I've been wrong. I was wrong on Mike Conley. I've been wrong on other guys before. He is not Hashim Thabit in any in any regard. Like he's a totally different player. I don't want a rookie center on a team trying to win a championship. I don't want it. I do not want it. I do not want a pretty stiff center on a team trying to win a championship. Do I like the idea of putting a center next to Jaron again? Yes, I do. I love that idea very much. Yeah. Do I want it to be Donovan Klingon? No, I don't. Do I want it to be Zachary Rishishay? Nope. Do I want it to be Alex Sard? No, sir. Like, <laughs> go get me a a fine veteran and I'm fine. You know who I would really like it if they had Steven Adams. Steven Adams. That's who I wish. <laughs> that's who I wish Memphis had. Uh, all right. We got to move on. Tell me about Reed Shepard, who I will say limited knowledge. I love this kid. I love this kid. I love this kid. 
I, I would take him number one. I love Reed Shepard. <laughs> Tell me about Reed Shepard. I, I love Reed Shepard. I, I'm so afraid that both of us love Reed Shepard. This to me is is my favorite player in the draft, but also to me the most like bamboozling, confounding draft evaluation because so let me start with all the stuff that I love. The the numbers, what this kid did this year as a freshman at Kentucky are outrageous. Like he is genuinely without hyperbole one of the greatest shooting prospects that I have ever seen based on the numbers that we saw this year. He shot 52% on threes this year. I'm not like massive volume, but not no volume. Like he took a bunch of threes. You break that down. He shot 25 of 55 on guarded catch and shoot threes, 45% on defended catch and shoot. He shot NBA threes 81 times. That's really good volume to show how deep he is. He made 40 of 81. That's half. He made half of his NBA three-pointers in college this year. The shooting is insane. He had a 70% true shooting, which by the way, we'll get to it. He's six foot three. He shot 70% true shooting at six foot three, which is like mind melting. And I don't know what to do with it. It is the best true shooting by any freshman in like the tracking that we have at Bart Torvik or elsewhere, which is at least 15 years of data. Additionally, despite being six foot three, he like makes defensive plays. His steal numbers are possibly as ridiculous as his shooting numbers. Like steals, we don't really look at steal numbers because they're so little, but his they're they're just they're crazy steal numbers. He had the highest steal rate of any high major freshman guard in the database, also for at least 15 years. He's blocking shots also at six foot three because he is so smart. He has such good IQ, such good feel for the game that even though his size is massively a red flag for the NBA, that you shouldn't be able to defend at that size. He has defended at that size. Kentucky defended at that size. When he played this year, Kentucky defensively went from 147th to 18th in net rating defensively when Reed Shepard was on the court. Those are like Donovan Klingon on the court numbers. This is Reed Shepard, the little dude. It, turnovers forced. They went from 156th to 51st. He's forcing turnovers. He is a defensive playmaker. I don't get it. I don't understand, but he is. Offensively, they went from 93rd to 4th in net rating, from 41st to 1st in adjusted offense with Reed Shepard on the court during the final stretch of the season. Like, the, the numbers are insane. The passing, it, like, passing, handle, those sort of things. He's going to have to play point guard because you're six foot three. You're playing point guard or you're defending point guards. At least like you're, you're that on a team. He's not an amazing passer. He's not an amazing handle, but I think he does fine. I think the passes are good. They're smart. He's going to move the ball quickly. He's going to make fast decisions. He's going to make smart decisions. You rarely see mistakes and turnovers Um, in a lot of ways, just to give some comps here, reminding me of Lonzo ball. And I was very high on Lonzo in the draft. And I honestly think it was a great evaluation. Lonzo got hurt now, but Lonzo had become a really valuable NBA player, a connector type who defends, who eventually learned how to shoot, Reed Shepard already shoots, and who did the transition pass, the look ahead, to get the, get the offense moving, just kind of like buzzing the offense. So here's my evaluation with him. Six foot three with a six three wingspan is like tiny, tiny in the NBA. Like, I thought of, okay, what about Lonzo Ball? What about Tyrese Halliburton? Guys I loved in the draft because they were different, but I liked how smart they were and I liked the feel for the game and all that. Great. Those guys are both six inches longer than Reed Shepard. That is troubling. Like, that is not a thing to be ignored. We're talking like uh, Steve Nash or Steph Curry or maybe modernized Mark Price. That's great. There's a reason there are only three of those dudes in like 30 years. That is like, cool. So be the best shooters in NBA history and you'll be great. We'll really like you then. Like, are we talking Steve Kerr instead? The player Steve Kerr? I I think actually the comp I came up with that I'm most interested by, and this is my last thing, kind of like Fred Van Vliet. I sort of feel like Fred Van Vliet is an interesting comp. He's a very similar size. Freddie is a good defender for his size. Um, I think Shepard is an even better shooter, but Freddie is a good defender. I think he's been a quality all-star player. He's been a player that is a winning player, and I think it's interesting. I know you're going to talk about this, but uh, we've seen Reed Shepard linked to Houston at three. I think that's interesting. Like, okay, 
go and learn from Freddie, a guy who went undrafted and then went out and turned himself into a, a franchise player. Uh, by the way, Reed Shepard has a 42-inch vertical. He's like quite athletic for a white American guard. So I like him a lot. You like him a lot. What do you have to say? I should have known that you were going to spend, give me a five-minute monologue. I have a lot to say about him. Look, he's number one on my draft board also. He's my guy. I know. I know. Uh, Houston, I'll say this. If you went, if you came back from the future and you could only tell me one thing, and you told me that Houston did not trade their pick, which I would ask you of all things, why that? What about the fate of the world? But if you told me that Houston <laughs> would not trade their pick, I would slam Reed Shepard minus 135 at BetMGM. To at go number three. To Houston. Yes. So if he doesn't go three, he's not getting past Charlotte. I'll say that. He's not getting past Charlotte at six. That is the absolute floor for him. There is no way he slips past that. If Castle's off the board, I think San Antonio would have to think real hard and long about taking Shepard. I think they probably think about that one long and hard. Like that's like a that that is a would think about it. But Houston at number three, if they do not trade it, Houston is looking at offers. They went from they spent about a week, about ten days. I heard about being like, no, we're we're gonna keep it, we're gonna keep it, and then we're like, what if we don't keep it and start taking offers again? And so they've been in a lot of conversations. But if Houston, it's hard to trade the number three pick. It's hard to trade picks. It's hard to trade top five picks can't believe the Sixers traded Jason Tatum but like if if, if it's that hard to do it there it to me it makes sense to bet on inertia and inertia says that they don't trade it and they take Reed Shepard number three at minus 135 that to me is a is too long of a number this should be minus 200 based off of how hard it is to trade picks again weird stuff is going to happen in this draft but if that that would be a bet I'm probably going to going to track that one later today in the action network app one more okay Give me your uh, your breakdown of a very interesting guy in Stefan Castle. Yeah, I have the least to say of the top five on this guy. Just I, I just like him. He's he's six seven. He's got plus wingspan. He's good size. I think he's a wing. He thinks he's a point guard. Apparently from draft interviews, which is a little bit concerning to me. But what I like about him is that he played for UConn as a freshman not as the star of the team. He played in a role he will play in the NBA. Like he played in what he will project to be. And he was good. He was efficient. He got normal minutes. He played on a champion, dominant champion team for UConn. And like a lot of times we have to project. We're like, oh, okay, you scored 30 a game in college and shot, you know, took all the usage. But also now you're going to be like a 15 minutes a game player and score a few points. How are you going to handle that? We've seen that with Castle. So I like that. He's smart. He has good positioning. He played well in a very complex system. I I like him off the ball. He cuts well. The shot is a big swing factor with him. He shot 27% on threes this year. That's not good. He only took two a game. That's even worse to me. But he did shoot 76% free throws. So I I like that part. That's a little more telling. Uh, But just there's a lot to like. It, to me, is a ready-made wing package that in a draft with uncertainty, that's worth, worth taking a shot on in the top five. He's been penciled into the Spurs pretty solidly at five. I have some skepticism based off of the fact of, um, sorry, four rather. At, at, he's been penciled into the Spurs at four based off of everything. Like the, he's been in for workouts. Everyone's penciled him in. I just get nervous because San Antonio is very good about concealing information. Like the stuff I've heard on Risa Shea is, is based off of what teams have gathered on Intel, not from like San Antonio people because they don't talk. They're very close to the vest. So whenever it's like, oh yeah, they're definitely taking this guy. Unless it's Wemon Yama when there was no question, I get a little bit uh I get a little bit nervous on that. That said, I think if Risa Shea is not there at four, I think Castle is most likely to go at four. Hmm. And you can get Castle number fourth overall at plus 170 still because of the uncertainty of the top three, you can get into those kind of scenarios. Um, so that's where I'm at on those. I do want to talk about this. So the, my best guess right now for the top order would be Klingon one. Sar goes two to Washington. Reed Shepard goes three to Houston. The Spurs take Reese Shea at four, five, I have no idea, but you can uh, you can get Klingon, Sar, Shepard at plus three seventy top three order. That was plus seven fifty three days ago, so that's taken a huge amount of money 
you, you can also get uh, there's a book now that has top four odds posted. You can get Clint MGM, yeah. Carr Shepard Risa Shea now at plus five fifty. So that's your exact outcome, including the fourth pick. Yeah. Uh, if Sar goes one, then Risa Shea I think goes number two, and then Klingon is the one that slides. Uh, the chalk on top three is Risa Shea, Sar, Shepard at plus 150, okay? So if you buy uh, all the mocks, look, these guys work all year round on draft, okay? I'm not saying I'm smarter than them. Like, I'm saying that the whole thing makes me think, based off of my read on stuff, is that there's a good chance Klingon goes one. If the Hawks keep the pick, but that might be the, that might be the result of this, is the Hawks are like, we, we like Klingon better. Let's just move back, and we'll take Klingon. And it could very much be... They trade with San Antonio. San Antonio takes Risa Shea, Risa Shea, Char, Shepard, and then the Hawks at number four take Donovan Klingon, and I lose all the money in the world. Um, not that much, because you can't bet that much. You should not bet that much on this draft. It's too unstable. So there's all these kind of scenarios. I will say that when you're looking at this, you should decide, like, do I think Houston's trading this pick or not? And what do I think? How much risk do I want to take on with that? If you're doing these top three, you need to evaluate that, because if you think you're like, it's hard to trade picks. Houston's like, I think Houston keeps it, and then they go Shepard. Then you've got one, and then you just got to figure out those top two based off of what you think. And that's why Reed Shepard is number three in all these uh, kind of scenarios. Um, if Klingon goes one and Reed goes two, I don't know where Star goes. I really don't. I don't think he goes three to Houston unless someone trades up. I don't know if San Antonio takes him. Five wouldn't surprise me. One last thing here. Again, Memphis is a team that could very much trade up to get Klingon. So that's how this winds up going three bigs. It could be Reese Shea, Saar to Washington, and then a team in Houston takes the pick or takes the trade with Memphis, and Memphis takes Klingon at three. Entirely possible. But if you ask me right now what I think is going to happen, my picks are Klingon, then Saar, Shepard, and then Reese Shea at four. Um, okay. We're going to hit on a few. We can't get to all of them today. Tell me about Mattis Bazellus. Yeah, I, I like don't love him. Like, I, I, I think he's good. I think he reminds me a lot of Franz Wagner, especially maybe like Joe Ingles, Tobias Harris. I think he's got good feel for the game. I think he projects to be like a fourth or fifth starter. Like, he's a connector. <clears throat> he can attack with the ball a little bit. I, I, I think that the skills that he's best at might not translate totally to the NBA level where the athletes have caught up to him compared to his past levels. But to me, actually, I, I look at him and Arisa Shea very similarly. But I've actually seen Bazellus play against NBA-type players, and I've seen him be pretty successful there individually, not as a team. The G League Ignite went 6-44 and this year, but I've seen Bazellus look pretty good. So I'm not running to the podium to get him, but I have him like as a solid top 10 quality uh, team-building sort of guy. So he's been mocked here forever. Um, his agent is Michael Tellum. Arn Tellum is vice president of the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> it is not a coincidence. It's not no relation. That's Arn Tellum's son. So something to kind of consider about, like, that I think is why he's been tied so consistently there. So, so tran translate that. Why, 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 you, you, you made eyes. What do the eyes mean? I mean, look, the vice president of the Pistons is the father of Madis' agent. So that's that to me is like a pretty obvious connection there, right? It's not like that simple, right? There's a whole process. And that is why I actually have some questions about this because that noise started coming before Trajan Langdon was hired as head of basketball operations for the Detroit Pistons. And there's been rumor in league circles that Langdon is not necessarily circled in on Bazellus. And if that's not the case, then there's a lot of value here. The problem is I don't know who it's, who it's going to be if it's not him. Like, I would love to be like, ooh, here's who it yeah. actually is going to be at number five. Like, maybe they trade. Cody Williams is the second at plus 375, which is, like, an interesting one. Um, another one that I think is uh, interesting here is Dalton Connects agent works for the same agency, Excel Sports Management. Now, that doesn't mean that there's any sort of connection there. It's not the same as Arn and Mike Tellum, Mike Tell but... Just something to kind of consider here that this is like the backroom politics. 
I am not as convinced that that Mattis Bazell is at plus one thirty five is as much as that that is an appropriate price. That's the best way I can kind of put it. Maybe instead of you should bet number five differently. Just I don't think that that Mattis number five is a good bet. So I was going to ask, you you sort of answered this, but do you think it's more likely that that connection you're talking about, is that connection showing us the cards that we got an insight to, or is that connection them doing their guy a a solid by being like, hey, look how Bazellus is a clear top five pick so that you see them all in the mock drafts and then it makes other teams maybe want to go get it. Like, which of those seems more likely to you and kind of how we're processing that? I think it's more of the former. I think that there was like kind of a, yeah, he's going to go number five. Like there was a top four and then there's five and Mattis is going to go next. Cause Mattis was like, he was considered to be one of the top three guys for a long time before the G league ignite season, which by the way, you should, I should mention this, that there is a lot of, there is, there's just a lot of, of maybe not the, the top decision makers, but there's a lot of league personnel that are like, I don't know about the G league guys anymore. The ignite guys have not, yeah. have not done well. And there's real reservations about them. Talk to me about Cody Williams. Yeah, another guy, I have him similar to to Steph Castle, just in that, like, I, in a draft with unknowns, I'm going to take swings on wings with upside. And he's got really good size. He's a pretty good athlete, you know, a bit limited explosively, but good change of pace. He gets to the rim really well. He is finishing 74% at the rim. That's best among non-big men. And he's getting to the rim three times a game, despite kind of being somewhat of a role player on that team. Uh, the shot, we don't know. He took 42% on threes, but not a lot of them this year. Not a lot of pull-ups this year, but the mechanics look pretty good. There's a lot to like. Like, we don't know a lot yet. He had a bunch of injuries this year that are not worrisome long-term, but it sort of muddied the data that we got on him. And then the other thing, of course, this is Jalen Williams, younger brother, J-Dub, that Jalen Williams. And uh, my guy, Jonathan Charks, had a theory that that younger brothers, you want to always get the younger brothers because... You're playing up with older brother, right? You're always playing against tougher competition and it's always like rising the level of play in you. And I think it's interesting, you know, that we have this guy that despite having some limitations athletically is is getting to the rim and and is doing some of the same stuff as Jalen. Just good size, fluid movement, good control, sort of guy that I think is worth taking a shot on. I have him top five on my board. So I've Portland is a team that's pretty routinely attached to him at seven. And I do think that there's probably value on him to go. He, he was actually posted as like a top 10 pick and he still is, um, or he's, he's listed at 10th. I'm sorry for Utah. That's like his floor for seventh. Cody Williams is the favorite at plus 400. I think there's probably some value there, but I do think that there is a chance that he goes five. If Mattis isn't the guy, if Bazellus isn't the guy at five, I think it's probably, I think this market is right. That it's Cody Williams. Um, he's a guy that's done very well in pretty much all of the, all of the workouts I've heard have gone very well for Cody Williams. Uh, we're going to skip Devin Carter for now. Um, yeah. tell me about some of the other guys that you really like. Yeah, I, I begrudgingly really like Ron Holland. He's second on my board to me, Ron Holland, I think has the most upside in the class, but he's raw. It's a package that you have to believe has not been coached up and you can get it out of him because right now he might just become like an R.J. Barrett type, which frankly in this draft is still a pretty good outcome probably. But if you've listened to me ever talk about anything, no, is not my guy. Uh, He's just a guy that I I think, again, in this draft with guys we don't love that we are not excited about, I'm going to take swings on the guys that I can find anything I like about them. And I'm going to take a swing on a wing player that has a lot of positive defensive upside. And we don't know offensively, but I think that he maybe has the the, the biggest star potential of any player in the class to me. Uh, a few like kind of my sleeper guys, three guys I have in the top 10 that I haven't really seen elsewhere. Ryan Dunn from Virginia, upperclassman guy, one of the best wing defensive players I've ever seen as a prospect before. Maybe the best wing defensive player. Now look, he is equally as bad offensively as he is good defensively. And you got to stay on the court and play. But I love to take a shot on guys that have a really clear profile and then are missing one key thing. And with him, if he can just learn how to hit a jumper, hit the open corner three, or even can he cut, can he get to the rim? We've seen guys lately. We've seen, you know, uh, with with the Warriors, with the Nuggets, we've seen non-shooting type guys be able to be really, really good defensively and find a role because we've optimized offense so well with some of these superstar players. These guys can go go play. So. Um, 
this is the section where I take some long shot, just swings on guys based on my own evaluations, really, because they're, they're long shot. So you can bet top 20, Ryan Dunn, 10 to 1 odds. That's one for me. Zach Eady, you know who Zach Eady is. We've all watched Zach Eady. I, I surprised myself on this one. I just feel like, why are we focusing so much on all the stuff we know he can't do? We know he can't do a bunch of things. We know he can do some really, really good stuff. We know what he can do and dominate. I, I would rather take Zach Eady than Donovan Klingon. I know the stuff Eady can do. I think they're similarly limited. But I also think Eady has improved and improved and improved and shown what he can do. I think he's a at least positive regular season player. I think there's certain matchups that he can just crunch and dominate dudes on. You can bet him top 10, six to one. I'd nibble that one. And then the guy was late to an international player that I actually really like, Bobby Clintman. You can get, go 10 to one on him, top 20. Just again, another upside swing on a wing. He's got good size. He's fluid. He can dribble. He can shoot. Uh, again, I don't know the international guys as well, but uh, those are guys I have top 10. Um, he is about even odds to go in the first round. I've seen him mock just outside the first round a few times. Adam Bona, UCLA big man, I think is a Clint Capella sort of guy, like a, a rim runner defender. He's four to one to go first round. I think I saw him mock 31 or 32. So that's right on the fringe. And the last one, Bob Carrington this is a guy I didn't even get to watch much during the season because he was a bit off, off the radar for Pittsburgh. He's one of the youngest players in the draft. He's very athletic. He has a wet, wet pull-up jumper. Like that is that jump shot to die for, the mid-range jumper. There are teams that love that, that love the youth profile. He is 20 to one to go top 10. I think that is a bit of a stretch, but I've seen him consistently in the lottery and this draft that's close enough to take a look. So those are guys I like that I think the mocks are showing as close enough to nibble some upside swings on. All right, I want to go back on, on some of these. Uh, I'm not going to touch Holland. I haven't heard much other than like... <laughs> I, I'm not betting Holland, floor, by the way. I just like him. Yeah, I think his floor, is, I think his floor actually might be 15 with Miami. Hmm. Um, but I will say, Ryan Dunn, uh, the Knicks are interested, but they also think that they can trade back into the second and get him. Hmm. So, now look, that sometimes I've heard that teams are like, oh yeah, we're going to trade back, and there's enough noise that teams start to be like, well, what if we take him? And then they wind up, they, they give him another look and they take the guy. So like, uh, I think top 20 at 10 to one is an aggressive play, but I understand like the way that you do these sure. things, I get it. Um, I, I will not, I like, I'm, I'm pretty good on him being second round from what I've heard. Uh, Edie, I will say that I, if you want to right now, I will bet you Khalil Ware at plus 140 goes ahead of, of Zach Edie. You can, <laughs> that, uh, Edie is minus 185 versus Ware to go first. Uh, I like Khalil Ware to go high above Zach Eady is what I would say. I would say. Um, and then Bona is the only other one I'll, I'll comment on that uh, you said he's plus 400 in the market to go first round. I do love that. His range is 20 to 40. Hmm. And I'm not saying that like it's not like it's 20 to 40. So his over under should be 29 and a half. That's right. not how this works. Yeah. Right. But I have heard that the lean on teams, I think that he is in more conversations. I've heard Bona has absolutely killed the workouts. He's done yeah. exceptionally good in the workouts. You need to keep in mind, this is not like, oh, he's a lock. There's no such thing, nope, especially with the first the rounders. Draft. But four to one, I think is good value uh, on him. And the last one is Bub Carrington. Um, I prefer targeting him specifically at OKC for him to go mm. specifically with that yeah, spot. Yeah, that's a great fit for him. Um, at 12, which is to look it up cause... yeah as you're looking that that is specifically the sort of team that would fall in love with a player that is athletic and super young developmental with the jumper like the, there are teams when i say there are teams oklahoma city is the team i am talking about so yeah, i'd love a top 12 instead so we got that one maybe i'll get an oklahoma city trades up for him what number did you find yeah. for him the, yeah the under on him is minus 180 for 18 and a half so uh, yeah. i'm sorry minus 140 i'm taking that all day every day um, yeah i mean uh, we're, the difference here on how we're betting this is I, I have almost no interest in median outcomes on these guys like i, yeah, I have no have concept of where yep. the medians go i just want to take yep. the long numbers and like if i'm betting these five sleeper dudes at long numbers my hope is to hit one of them and then some drafts I i'll hit none of them earlier, I, I, I mentioned this earlier i don't think that like look i don't think that there's a right and wrong way to bet the draft i don't i think like you can i think you can have your own instincts on who's good and who's not and bet those things. I think I don't think that there, there's a wrong way to do that. Like we've talked about this about one of the problems is, is you're like, well, I could be right about who's good and who's not, and then these GMs just won't take them 
and you're absolutely right on that but like these rooms are made of basketball people and they're seeing the same things that you are most of sure. the time so i think that there's that like you can bet that way and you'll have some hits and you'll have some misses and then you'll have good drafts and bad drafts i've had terrible drafts we've had awesome drafts right we've done pretty well the last couple of years yeah. of action but we'll see where it lines up i want to cut the podcast off but we have i i we got to do this Talk to me about Bronny James. <laughs> I thought we were talking about draft prospects. Just That's kidding. Mean. Just kidding. That's mean. That's okay. mean. All right. So look, Bronny James is a draft prospect because his name is Bronny James. I'm just going to say it like it is. Bronny James is absolutely an NBA athlete. The athletic genes worked. The athletic part is there. He has a very strong B spark score. The thing we talked about earlier that part is there. However, the size has not come. He is only six foot two is a decent wingspan there. But like, again, at that size, you are basically a point guard. You are guarding only guards. He projects as a possibly, uh, certainly as a plus defender. He's, he tries hard defensively. He's a smart defender. He's played obviously a lot of basketball, been around a lot of basketball. Um, I guess this has not been said on this podcast, but just to be clear, this is LeBron James' son, in case you somehow don't know who Bronny James is. The genes are working, but this is also a guy that the raw numbers are not working for. Here's the stats from 25 games at USC as a freshman. 4.8 points a game, 2.8 rebounds, 2.1 assists. How about some shooting splits? 37, 27, 68. Ouch, not great. Like, these are not numbers that are draftable for a one and done freshman. And I'm not just speculating that there literally are no freshmen one and dones in history in databases that have been drafted with these numbers. They are numbers being drafted because his name is Bronny James. Athleticism is very great. He is an NBA athlete. There are a lot of NBA athletes who are not in the NBA because it turns out you also have to have the NBA skills and size to play in the NBA. And I do like his defense. I think he can be a positive team defender. We're talking like Avery Bradley-ish sort of player. But you can't draft just the defense side of that when there's not a lot else there. I don't see a lot of runway on offense. There also is real health concerns with him. I It seems like he's been cleared from the cardiac arrest scare that he had. I hope that that is the case. I wish him very well. Teams don't necessarily know. Like that alone could cross him off the list for some teams. I think if you just gave him a different name, this is not a player that we would know at all or know that he happened this year or be talking about. I don't think that we are doing him any favors by including him in draft discussions or on draft podcasts, but his name is in fact Bronny James. Therefore we are. Yeah, we absolutely have to talk about him. I want to say this. It's absolutely unfair to this kid what's happening. And he has smart people looking after him, and he's going to make quite a bit of money in his career, and he's going to get a better chance than a lot of guys would in his similar situation. But that's going to come with a lot of undue pressure and a lot of undue expectation. There is a wide assumption he goes to the Lakers. There are markets that will let you bet which team drafts him. Do not bet those markets. And the reason you should not bet those markets, even though it's like, Matt, he's going to the Lakers, come on, is because those are based off of what team has the pick that drafts him. So if Minnesota drafts him and trades him to the Lakers, Minnesota is the bet that hits, not the Lakers. So it is too messy. They could find any number of teams with an over-under 44 and a half. They could find any number of teams to get this deal done. And a pizza. My understanding is they don't is that Clutch would prefer that he is not on a two-way deal. He's gonna have to answer constant constant questions from about his dad. Every question is gonna be about playing with his dad. Every city he goes to, he's gonna get so sick of it. And every performance is gonna be every detail. If he doesn't play, why isn't Bronny playing? If he does play, why is he playing if he struggles? Like there's so much pressure and expectation on this kid. And it's cool. If it winds up the way that it's looking like that, he's going to get to play with his dad. Like that is a uniquely cool story. Like that is an awesome thing that's going to occur. You're going to get to see two generations of NBA players on the same floor sometimes. 
at the same time, like it's just going to put such an undue level of pressure on him versus if they had just been like, Hey, if he gets drafted, like we're not going to interfere. If you want to draft him, draft him. If he's undrafted, we'll find somewhere for him to play. If he has to go to G league, he's going to go to G league. And we, you know, we believe in the kid and he's going to find his way there. And it, and he'll have all of the financial and training and all of that support that's afforded by his father's position in the league. And it's not that I feel like this is unfair to some other prospect. The, the entire second round of the draft is unfair. It's all pretty random. Yeah. Teams are trading out. Teams are, are drafting and stashing. They sell, like they sell picks routinely, right? Just for cash. There's yeah, which again is why you picks. shouldn't bet the Lakers because guess who has cash? The Lakers. And they're just going to buy somebody's pick if they want to take him. Right. And so from that perspective, I, I just, I wish that there was, that Bronny James was being set up with a, better opportunity for him to be able now he might just thrive maybe he's going to come in and kick Great. ass and win a roster spot and win a rotation spot and what a story that will be with the lakers or with another team if lebron decides to go what i will say if any other team takes him and they don't trade that pick to the lakers all hell is going to break loose on one on thursday <laughs> that's when all hell breaks loose but that nobody's expecting that well what, okay, what about it, it, it is mm-hmm. What if we get to pick number 55 where the Lakers have a pick and they do not take him? Is that a similar reaction? Is, is there a, like what define all hell breaking loose? What is that meaning in the LeBron sphere of things? If he goes anywhere else, if he is, if it's, if he doesn't go drafted, that I think that's a different thing. If he is drafted anywhere else and that pick isn't traded to the Lakers, we're all going to be like, is LeBron, Ron going there if Dallas picks him if the Suns acquire a second rounder and they take him if Philly takes him if any other team takes Bronny James the immediate question is is LeBron James going to leave the Lakers and sign there which would be insane after hiring JJ Redick but (laughs) it's something at least we got to mention uh all right that's gonna do it for Bucket thanks for joining us appreciate you guys being with us we'll be with you tomorrow Best bets episode with Fiddle and Joe Delera. We'll get your best bets going into Wednesday. Buckets live before the draft, going through the first five picks, and then after Brandon and I will break down futures as well as react all to any and all trades that occur that night. My thanks to David Payne for producing. My thanks to Hutton Jackson, and the video crew, getting us up on youtube.com slash the action network. We'll see you guys again next time. Till then, let's get draft buckets. 